So we've talked a little bit about neuroplasticity and long-term potentiation. So I'm going to pull some of this together and bring it into a different context. Remember that when we talk about neuroplasticity, we're looking at this concept that our, our nervous system and our neurons and the connections between them change every day over, over time and over experience. And so we want to uh, look at that uh, specifically in some of the circuits that we're going to be talking about, um, for example, learning and memory, um, and talk about this thing we know of as called long-term potentiation, or LTP. So here's some of the key concepts we've already mentioned about how the circuitry in the brain changes through experience, and that these changes are seen at the synaptic level. So we look at where the synapses are and what ha is happening there. Um, the activity at the synapse is going to cause changes that could be called upregulation. So that means that there's going to be a number of things that happen at that particular synapse that's going to strengthen the activity in the future um, of that those connections, of that circuit. Um, and the, same, the opposite can happen too, and that is that that activity can be downregulated or that, sorry, the synapse, uh, synaptic activity could be downregulated um, such that it, it becomes less active because we aren't using that circuit anymore, so it, it basically downgrades a bit. So we looked at this idea that in, we've talked about just the communication between one neuron and another, but really we understand that in most cases, we aren't looking at something that's linear like this, but we're looking at something that's much more um, of a network. So we're going to talk a little bit about more about neural networks. So long-term potentiation, we're going to use to talk about strengthening the synapse, and we're going to use that as a model of learning and memory. So memory circuits, you can, this isn't very big, but we can make it maybe a little bit bigger. I don't no, uh, but I'll show you this in class. But the we acquire information through a bunch of sensory modalities. So in other words, we hear something. That would be our auditory pathway. We might see something. That would be our visual pathway. We have um, taste, right? So that would be gustatory. That's a term for taste. Um, and others, right? So when we pick up sensory information, that's how we learn about our world. And when we learn, we're already talking about learning when we start uh, referring now to memory, right? So usually we, when we pick up information, it, it's not, um, it doesn't just disappear. Some of it will, because some of it isn't necessary, but some of it we actually want to hold on to. And so that's where we're going. So here's an example of a pathway. This is an auditory pathway. We haven't talked much about hearing, but we get uh, some signal, right? And that would be the, our ears. And so that would be um, some type of uh, signal, like a sound, that will enter our ear and go to the cochlea of our ear. That's the thing that kind of looks like a snail. And there are neurons in there, and those neurons are gonna have an action potential. So that action potential then is going to send information from those cochlear neurons to various areas of the brain. So this one, if you can see it, this is going to go to the mid-pons, and then it goes a little bit further into the pons again, into the midbrain, and then we go into more into the midbrain, into that inferior colliculus. If you remember what those little hill-like structures were when we looked at the sheep brain, and then we go to something called the medial geniculate, which actually is in the thalamus. Remember, a lot of things go through the thalamus. And then we eventually go to the primary auditory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe. So this is where our, where our, our, the part of our cortex that's devoted to hearing and sounds. OK, good. Now, we hear sounds all day long, right? So. A lot of sounds just literally go in one ear and out the other, but there are sounds that we, we do want to pay attention to. So that the attentional networks in our, in our 
in our frontal area of our brain and in our brain stem. There are lots of circuits that are devoted to us paying attention to something, if it's important. Um, and so those may be activated in this case too. Um, so when the, that first action potential happens in, that, um, in your ear, in that auditory part of your, uh, your cochlea, and then eventually it gets to this auditory cortex, if that's important, then that information it, the, uh, continues, and that continuing goes to an area that we're going to call the perirhinal and the parahippocampal cortices. So these are two areas that you can see on this diagram. I'm not sure you can see them too well, but peri, uh, perirhinal cortex, there's a little line in here that sort of shows it, an entorhinal cortex is there. Um, and then the parahippocampal cortex. So we're looking in this general vicinity, just, just for the sake of seeing something here. Um, and so that information is going to go there. Now this area is in an, also an area called the limbic system. And the limbic system is, has those structures we know of, like the amygdala and the hippocampus, and some other areas that we'll talk about a little bit more later. But what we get is that sensory input, this time from the temporal area, from our temporal lobes now, are going to get sent to these peri and para areas, these uh, perirhinal and perihippocampal cortex. And then they send information on to this thing we're going to call the ento, E-N-T-O, rhinal cortex, so, which eventually gets sent to the hippocampus. So you can see here is a, is a complicated network. Um, and so once we get to the hippocampus, then we're going to see what happens there. And so we'll, we'll talk about the circuitry. This is kind of a repeat of what I just said with a little bit more simplification of that information than going to these, these two different areas these, uh, of the cortex and then eventually going to the hippocampus. Right, so there we have the hippocampus. All right, a hippocamp the word hippocampus it means uh, seahorse, and it's because there is kind of a kind of a curly seahorsey looking shape here that we're going to see. Um, and now let's move to here. I don't this kind of divided this little arrow that I had here, but this is somewhat of a, uh, it's an enlarged version of a hippocampal area. So the hippocampus is often the connections that happen within the hippocampus there are very often called trisynaptic because that's exactly what there are there are three areas that form synapses here and we're going to look at how that works so this was taken from an article uh, from a research article by Patton et al um, in 2015 and I, I copied this figure but I also copied the, the, the um, description under the figure because I think I, when I wrote this out I'm not sure I tried to simplify this but this will give you some of the other details if you want to look at that but basically it's this so once now this information has reached the EC or the entorhinal cortex it's going to get sent via the second layer of the entorhinal cortex because a lot of these areas of the cortex are layered they have different layers and so layer two of the entorhinal cortex is going to send its information into the area we know of as the dentate gyrus. So this is the dentate gyrus in here. And the pathway that this goes along is called the perforant pathway. So that's what that's referring to. This is the there's a medial perforant pathway and a lateral one. That's what these terms are referring to. But regardless, they go to this thing called the DG, the dentate gyrus. And it's in the dentate gyrus then that information is sent further. And it's sent to this area, CA3. And CA uh, stands for cornus ammonis, which is, um, I think it looked like um, it was some biblical term, uh, some uh, Horn or something that was used by the Israelites. I think and somebody saw that and kind of looked like it to them. So anyway, this is CA. So just say CA3. So from the dentate gyrus, we're going to go to the CA3 region. That's what we're seeing right here. 
We have something called mossy fibers. So here's the MF, so mossy fibers. So we're seeing that, that, that connection here. And the mossy fibers are unmyelinated. And so that's kind of why they're just called mossy fibers. Um, they are neurons, but they don't have myelin. So then they go to the CA3 region. And then from the CA3, they go to CA1. And for, from CA1, they, they, and they get to the CA1 via this pathway, which is called the Schaefer collaterals. So let me recap this. This is the trisynaptic circuit. When information gets to the entorhinal cortex, let's say from your ear, right? So it's moved from uh, one of, or your visual cortex, but it, it reaches here, goes this away to the dentate gyrus via this perforant pathway. From the dentate gyrus, it's going to go via some mossy fibers to the CA3 section of the hippocampus. So remember, this is all hippocampus. And then the third circuit within the hippocampus is goes to the CA1, all right, which is via these, these things we call Schaefer SC, Schaefer collaterals. All right, a lot of words here. But basically what we're seeing is that this hippocampal structure is it has this this pathway really important so this is critical to us uh, learning anything anything new if you don't have this you're gonna have trouble learning anything in particular anything that we associate with what well, we associate with learning was which would be like words and um, context of things so the our memory systems rely on this hippocampal structure to first encode information in here. Okay, so hang with me here. Now, just to kind of distinguish, uh, make a distinction between learning and memory, learning is how we get information, and memory is, we, we can define as some type of a behavioral change that's going to be caused by that experience. So there's there's a we learn something and then and if and only if we actually do then we acquire some type of memory right um and then the memory is uh, we can talk about now so here's my next little thing here so memory itself human memory has many different forms and it's not always in the same place in the brain but the type that we are talking about right now that you see right in here, um, which includes explicit memory, things that you're, you are conscious to you, you, you know what they are. Um, things which are declarative, such as knowing a fact or an event. And those which have those things associated with uh, a place, like an episode of time, a moment in time experience or just simply the facts themselves, like I'm going to spell semantic, that would be a fact. All of these are based, these types of memory are based in the hippocampus. In the rodents, which a lot of times we're looking at models of rodents, um, this is particularly important for spatial memory, because for them, knowing where they are in space is really, uh, in you know their position at any given moment is really important. So this is hippocampal memory. Now, in the time we have here, I think that's a good introduction, and I'm going to keep going um, in the next short video. So we'll stop right there, and um, I'll take it from there.